Good morning, welcome to the webinar. This is Roger Royce, founder of the Royce Law Firm, a business tax and corporate law firm with offices in Northern and Southern California. And today's webinar is going to take up the topic of health care reform and the new health care laws that are coming into effect January 1, 2014. Uh, with me today, I have two speakers from Insperity. I have Jen Coco, who is the district manager uh, of Insperity, a trusted advisor to America's best businesses for more than 27 years. Jen's been with Insperity for over five years and has earned a multitude of awards, including three years of Chairman's Club, and has become a certified business performance advisor. She's got a bachelor's in economics from Michigan, Ann Arbor, and graduated Phi Beta Kappa. Joining Jen today is Jennifer Young, also a district manager with Insperity for the Peninsula Silicon Valley office. Jennifer's been with Insperity for over five years and has achieved multiple Chairman's Club awards and has become a certified business performance advisor. So I'd like to remind you folks that this webinar is being recorded. You'll find it on RoyceUniversity.com. It'll also be available for download as a podcast in the iTunes store and will be available on Royce Law's YouTube site. Um, you'll notice that on your screen there's a dialog box. If you have questions, please go ahead and type your questions in the box. We'll collect them and then hopefully we'll have time at the end uh, to answer your questions or respond or possibly follow up one-on-one. -on -one. So, Probably everybody knows that, uh, uh, that we're about to undergo one of the most significant changes in health care uh, that we've ever seen. And it goes into effect, as I said, as of January 1, 2014, although uh, things are going to start happening this year. Uh, open enrollment on the state exchanges will start October 1, 2013. So we all need to be gearing up. Uh, what this means from our standpoint, of course, is number one, there, there have been some new taxes that have come into effect to pay for this that we've already done some webinars on. Uh, there are going to be some new taxes, penalty taxes, that will be coming into effect for employers who, uh, who don't comply or who provide what they call Cadillac plans. And in addition, there are certainly a lot of what I view as relatively complex requirements that employers now have to comply with. And there are some planning opportunities. There are some things that some employers, especially the smaller companies and the middle market companies, uh, can do in anticipation of the new changes that are coming into effect. So with that introduction, I am going to turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Roger. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank you for inviting us to be a part of today's webinar. We're happy to be here. Um, and before we get started, what I wanted to do is just briefly qualify who we are and how the information we are about to share was compiled. Um, as Roger said, Jen Coco and I and myself are with Insperity. We're the founder and leader of the professional employer organization industry. Our company was founded more than 27 years ago and is still uh, headquartered in Houston, Texas today. Uh, for the past several years, we've remained at the forefront of understanding the complexity and changes taking place throughout the introduction and development of the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as health care reform. And how this information was put together is that we have formed or organized a 40-person task force comprised of members of our executive leadership, subject matter experts, as well as several full-time lobbyists in Washington. Uh, the information we are about to share is a direct result of their continued hard work and dedication in putting together what we understand to be the most comprehensive and accurate representation of healthcare reform as it stands today. So that's my little qualifier. Um, what we're going to be talking about this morning is a general overview of health care reform, or what we also know as the Affordable Care Act. Some of the things that will be discussed are critical decisions and considerations that need to take place this year, as Roger intimated. Um, a lot of small and mid-market com mid companies are getting ready for health care reform um, and some of the things that need to take place this year. We're going to talk about individual mandate or um, the employer shared responsibility, otherwise known as pay or play, as well as the reporting requirements the additional cost taxes and fees that Roger um, suggested he's going to share, talk a little bit about as well, and as well as the state exchanges. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jen Coco, who will tackle the first part of the presentation, and then I'll jump in in the latter part. 
Great. For each of the five major provisions, we will discuss the potential impact to the business owner, um, the complexity in their purchasing decisions, the increased compliance requirements, and also the rising costs for the small business. So we're going to start with the individual mandate. So what is the individual mandate? Well, effective in January of 2014, all individuals must purchase qualifying health insurance. Um, limited except, exceptions do apply, and there are penalties for failure to comply, and this is going to be collected through an individual's federal income tax return. So penalties are unlikely to impact employee behavior in 2014. Um, as you can see here, the um, failure to comply results in a fee of $95 per adult and $47.50 per child in 2014, up to $285 a family, or 1% of household income, whichever is greater. So this is not a lot up for a fee, but by the time we get to 2016, this will be up to $695 for an adult and up to $2,085 a family a year, or 2.5% of annual income, whichever is greater. So as time goes on, the penalties will affect employee behavior. So critical considerations to take into account for a business. Are you prepared to answer employees' questions? Employees will hear about the individual mandate and have questions. Questions not only about the mandate, but also as well as their options with the exchanges. Will the penalty change your employees' behavior? Unlikely in 2014, as we just mentioned, although a minimum, at a minimum, we expect employees to reconsider their decision to buy the health care insurance. And there may be employees who simply do not want to pay a penalty to the IRS. Will employees enroll in your health care insurance offering? A lot of companies that we're talking with right now are taking a survey of their employees to find this out. What is the impact to your plan design and your total health care costs? Those not electing currently may elect in 2014, which will potentially increase your health care costs as an organization. So let's take a, a closer look at an example of the potential impact to a business owner. So here we have the individual mandate, and we have a company um, that has 40 employees. Coming to 2014, all employees will be required to have health care insurance. So currently today, this company only has 75% participation. They have 10 employees that are not enrolled in their medical. And looking at the cost per um, person a year is $5,000 that the company is paying um, a year for the medical. So if we look at the impact um, in 2014, if all of these employees, these 10 employees, choose to then elect um, because of the individual mandate, the employer's cost of offering coverage will increase. So 10 employees by the $5,000 a year cost is $50,000 for that company. So that's pretty significant and something companies need to budget for and be thinking about today to be prepared for next year. So now we're going to look at the employer share responsibility and the player pay. So what is the player pay? Well, employers with 50 or more full-time equivalents are subject to player pay penalties if certain minimum requirements are not met. And those re requirements are coverage, value, and affordability. And this is triggered when one or more full-time employees obtains coverage through a state exchange and receive the premium tax credit or cost-sharing subsidy. So please note that a full-time employee is not the same as a full-time equivalent, which we're going to get into in a minute. Okay, so what is a full-time equivalent? The initial step that companies need to take is to determine, first of all, if the play or pay rules will apply to their business. Business owners must consider their controlled group status to determine full-time equivalents under the healthcare reform. So in other words, you cannot just split your workforce into two companies to avoid the healthcare reform. Determination of the full-time equivalent under the healthcare reform is based on a monthly calculation requiring business owners to have access to accurate data as listed. So if you see here, they're going to need to track hours of status for employees, um, and they're going to be looking at, on a monthly basis, employment status, whether they're full-time, whether they're part-time or seasonal, their hire date, hours work. And 
So the total hours worked by non-full-time employees also will factor into the calculation as defined by the health care reform. So an example, I was talking with a business the other week that's in Oregon. They have um, three different locations. It's a restaurant slash bar. And um, they have 75 employees currently, but only 26 of those are full-time. And because they have so many part-time employees, when they went and did the calculations according to what a full-time equivalent is, um, that they actually come out to be over 50 full-time equivalents with this calculation, and they're going to have to comply next year with the health care reform and offer medical to their employees, which they currently do not. So the definition of a full-time employee is unusual, and calculations are complex, and mistakes can be very costly for an organization. So we're going to take a look at minimum value and affordability, and this generally refers to the total premium the affordability generally refers to the total premium paid by the employee. So the minimum value requirement um, generally refers to the percentage of benefits costs covered by the plan. So this is going to be 60% of minimal essential benefits costs that are going to be required coming into next year. And another term you may hear for this minimum value is actual, actuarial plan value. Um, one important item to note is that a safe harbor does exist for an employer so they can use a W-2 earning instead of a household income to determine affordability for their employees. And the affordability means that the plan is not to exceed 9.5% of the household income. Okay, some critical considerations to take a look at as a business. Do you offer health care insurance currently? Does your health care insurance offering meet the minimum value and affordability requirements? How many full-time employees do you have under the new health care reform calculation? Do you think that all, any or of your full-time employees will receive a subsidy for state exchange coverage? And if so, what is your exposure to play or pay penalties? Okay, so we're going to take a look at an example of a potential impact to a business owner. And this penalty is for a company that is currently not offering the minimal essential coverage. So the penalty for this is $2,000 for all full-time equivalents. So the first 30 are free if any full-time equivalent receives a subsidy for exchange coverage. So we have this company here that has 50 full-time equivalents, and right now they're, they have coverage, but it's not meeting the minimum essential coverage. So one full-time equivalent goes to the exchange, so it just takes one, and that one person gets a subsidy. The penalty on the employer is then triggered. And the penalty would be the 50 employees that they have minus the first 30 times $2,000. So that company would have to pay a fine of $40,000. So now we're going to take a look at the potential impact of a business owner if they're not offering the minimum value and affordability coverage. So this penalty is $3,000 for each full-time equivalent who receives the subsidy for the exchange coverage. So, or the penalty for not offering the minimum essential coverage, whichever is less. So this company also has 50 employees, and they're offering coverage, but it doesn't meet that minimum value and affordability. So 10 of their full-time equivalents in this example go to the exchange. Five of them end up getting subsidies. So only five of them actually qualify to get subsidized. And then the penalty on the employer is then triggered, so that is five five employees times the $3,000, so $15,000 fine for this business. So the thing to remember here is that the penalty is triggered only when a full-time equivalent obtains a subsidy for the exchange coverage. So now we're going to touch upon the re reporting requirements that are coming for next year. So the healthcare reform, it introduces substantial new reporting requirements for employers and insurance carriers. Employers with 50 or more employees or full-time equivalents are subject to these new reporting requirements. However, as of right now, there's no specific federal reporting requirements for under 50 employees or full-time equivalents. So some of these elements required for the reporting to the IRS, um, number of full-time equivalents employed each month of the year, the name, address, and taxpayer identification number for each of these full-time equivalents during the year and month when they were covered under the health care plan the length of your waiting period, 
Um, they need a certified coverage was offered to these full-time equivalents and dependents. Um, the month the employer sponsored the plan, the premium for the lowest cost option, and the employer's share of the total allowed cost per benefit. So what's coming for 2014? So there's going to be potential new requirements for all employers. Um, so this is for 50 or under 50. So state local reporting, exchange reporting, employment plan offering verifications, and penalty appeals. So although the rules and regulations aren't clear today, we believe that the new reporting requirement will affect all business owners. For example, if an employee applies for state exchange, the exchange will need to verify from the employer whether or not this person is receiving qualifying coverage from their employer and how big they are in regards to the full-time equivalent status. If a penalty is then assessed, the business owner may have to prove they were under that 50 full-time equivalent and are not required to offer coverage or that they are over 50 and provided the opportunity for full-time equivalent to enroll in their medical. So every business will be affected because as soon as somebody goes to that exchange and applies um, they're going to have to prove the size of their business and that they either qualify or do not qualify. Um, something else to think about, so we talked with a lot of companies that kind of um, look at their 1099s and say that they're not really sure if they should be 1099s or W-2 employees. And um, one of the things where there's an audit that's triggered is when that 1099 files for unemployment. And another thing to think about with this new regulation with the health care reform is what if a 1099 of yours goes to the exchange and applies for a subsidy and they say that they work for you. So this could also trigger an audit, um, not only to report on the health care reform, but also to kind of prove the status of being a 1099 versus a W-2 employee. So critical considerations. Are you prepared to comply with the existing or future reporting requirements? Are your payroll processing, benefits administration, and HR services managed by multiple systems and or vendors? And if yes, you'll need somebody within your organization to collect all this information from payroll, benefits, and their human resources. So although we're seeing um, many companies offer help and many insurance brokers, they only have access to the benefits piece for the reporting purposes. How will you coordinate the tracking of necessary information and submit the appropriate reports on a timely basis. Failure to file these required reports will put the business owner at risk for significant penalties. Okay, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about cost, taxes, and fees. Um, so what is it? Obviously, the Joint Committee on Taxation is the Congress of the United States. So the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation recently identified more than 20 new or increased taxes, totaling almost $1.1 trillion over the next 10 years. Um, it's a staggering number, and we're already starting to see, I know in my, in my daily work life, I'm already starting to see the, um, the impact of taxation specific to health care reform in a lot of our um, potential clients' medical renewals. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So nearly double the original 2010 projection. Originally, when the Affordable Care Act was first being developed, they were talking about um, limiting the number of taxes. And as we know it today, that, um, that hasn't exactly happened. $25 billion in taxes affecting health insurance costs in 2014 alone. So next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about what the taxes look like. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but you'll see that we know You'll see that we know taxes and fees on health insurance costs um, and health care by industry will increase costs for businesses by three to five, three and a half to four percent, or roughly four hundred dollars per employee per year. Um, excise taxes, the transitional reinsurance fee tax, patient-centered outcomes research initiative fee, pharmaceutical manufacturer excise tax, and medical device sales tax. Um, and again, this is just in 2014. They're anticipating the additional taxation per employee to be about $400 per year. So what is it? Individual and small market reforms. So what we're talking about are states will heavily regulate small group and individual premiums. Um, adjusted community rating is going into effect January 1 of 2014 for companies under 15 that will limit pricing variables. Previously, small businesses have enjoyed, um, or companies have enjoyed premiums based on age, gender, geography, health of the organization, 
and that's essentially going to go away. So um, some states may further limit variations or eliminate altogether. Other rating factors will be prohibited, such as prior claims experience, health status, gender, industry, and duration of coverage. What this means is that no longer will health insurance companies be able to deny coverage for some, um, to anyone, for that matter, regardless of pre-existing condition. Pricing of identical med medical plans offered inside and outside of state exchanges must be the same. This is going to be big because if you're a small business and you've got folks, or even if you decide that the state exchange is a viable option for your company, which I think we, you know, it still remains to be seen, but I think for some small mom and pop businesses, the state exchange might not be a bad idea. However, if you've got employees in multiple states, it's the business owner's responsibility to make sure that the coverage options by state is comparable or the same for all employees, otherwise additional penalties may apply. And not all states are going to participate in state exchanges. There will be some states, which I'll show you on a slide in just a moment, um, that are going to be federally uh, managed. So there's really going to be limit, uh, limited, if any, control over the plan um, details for each one of those states. Other requirements affecting costs include guaranteed issue and renewability. This is specific to what I just mentioned. Guaranteed issue refers to the fact that nobody who's previously been denied coverage will be denied co will be able to will be denied coverage under the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, maximum deductible levels and minimum plan values. So critical considerations for a business owner: How will this new small group pricing regulations impact cost structure? You know, community rating is going to have a pretty significant effect in a large, large number of uh, geographic locations. I'm going to use San Francisco for as, an, as an example where you have, and Silicon Valley, where you have a high concentration of technology startups that, you know, historically employ a lot of young people. Previously, those companies have enjoyed lower cost premiums. What we're going to start seeing with community rating is essentially a leveling of the playing field with regards to health care costs. So if you've got, by geography, we'll say San Francisco, a large concentration of technology startups that employ young people, the cost of their medical insurance under community rating is going to increase considerably. And I use that term lightly. The figures that we've been hearing are 70 to 300 percent. What's going to happen for companies that have a largely older demographic is that they'll see their premium costs come down a little bit. It's not going to level the playing field in that you know, you're going to see a 50 percent increase for the, you know, in cost for the younger group and a 50 percent de decrease in cost for the older group. Um, it's going to largely impact, you know, organizations that have a younger demographic. Um, how will taxes and fees impact your cost structure? You know, if you have to plan for additional taxes and fees for each full-time employer, anybody offered coverage, you know, in the past what we've seen are companies kind of degrade the quality of the plan, higher deductibles, higher out-of-pocket maxes, higher co-pays. Those options are not going to be offered or really going to be a viable option going forward at any kind of sustained rate because then you run the risk of your plan not meeting minimum um, plan value and affordability. How can you modify your plan designs to offset expected cost increases? Should you adjust employee contributions to offset expected cost increases? This is something that a lot of companies are looking at right now. You know, Northern California is a very competitive job market, especially in the technology sector. And one of the things that employees are looking at when they go to a new company is, what are my options here with regards to medical insurance? And it's not just medical, it's dental and vision, it's all of the ancillary benefits. They also look at, what is the employer contributing toward my benefits? So increasing the cost share for employees um, is probably something that's going to be inevitable. Otherwise, it's just not going to be sustainable for small businesses to offer you know, competitive coverage. But at a certain point, you're going to make it cost prohibitive. And then you run the risk of your plan or the affordability in exceeding that 9.5% of household income for an employee. So as a business owner, there's going to have to be significant oversight at the employee level looking at how much are they making on their W-2. And if I'm asking this, them to contribute a specific amount to, the, to their insurance, does it exceed that 9.5 percent. It's going to be hard for them to quantify what a household income is. That safe harbor will be specific to um, the individual W-2. Can you adjust your product or service prices to cover your expected cost increases? So cost of goods. Will we increase the cost of our services and cost of our products to help offset 
the, uh, the cost of health care insurance or the additional cost for health care under health care reform and looking at is that a viable option? You know, will we price ourselves out of our market? Will our competitors still remain um, less expensive? So these are all things that need to be taken into consideration. Next we're going to talk about state exchanges. So state exchanges, what are they? State exchanges will be marketplaces for individuals and small businesses to view, compare, and purchase health insurance. Um, for those of you that are in California, I don't know if everybody's in California, but um, if you want more information on the California State Exchange, you can go to Covered California, I believe it's .org. Um, if you just Google Covered California, you'll be able to find it. Um, this creation is mandated by health care reform. Open enrollment for state exchanges begins October 1st of 2013 with coverage beginning on January 1, 2014. Some regulations have yet to be finalized. Um, I believe some states have yet to finalize whether or not they're going to participate in the state exchange or if they'll be part of the federal exchange. The processes, products, and pricing still are still in development. We do know that. Um, Covered California, there's a lot of great information on that site. So I believe they've already got the um, health care, health insurance providers that are planning on participating as well as some um, base level pricing. So you're going to hear a lot with regards to state exchanges about the metal plans. And when I say metal, it's M-E-T-A-L. So the plan levels are referred to in four different categories, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. So the plan value that Jen talked about earlier, that minimum 60% coverage, that 60% of medical um, expenses need to be covered by the plan, that would refer to the bronze plan. And then as you see as the yeah, you go to silver, gold, and platinum. It, we, we commonly hear about this referred to as coinsurance. So if your plan has 70 or 80 percent coinsurance, meaning that once the deductible's been met, the plan pays 70 or 80 percent. Um, this is for individuals. For small businesses, for 50 to less than 50 to 100 employees, the group plans are also going to be classified by this metal designation. Um, and for a group plan, it has to meet the minimum plan value is that bronze plan or bronze, the 60% coinsurance. Um, so again, it will include four levels of medical plans with varying coverage levels. Some state exchanges are expect expected to initially offer only medical and, and prescription coverage. This is something that needs to be considered because if a small business decides that the state exchange is a viable option, the chances are they're still going to have to go to a broker to source dental, vision, or any other ancillary benefits such as life and personal accident insurance. Because right now the state exchanges are only talking about offering medical and basic prescription coverage. And I think with Healthy California or Covered California, um, it only covers the prescription coverage only applies to generic drugs. Okay, next slide. So what is it? Subsidies we will be available through state exchanges for those earning up to 400% of the federal poverty level. What this equates to is about $46,000 annually for an individual and about $94,000 for a family of four. So this is important to note. I was talking with a company um, up in Washington recently. They're a relatively young company, very low participation in their medical plan. And when we were looking at the plan details, it was no surprise because their current medical plan has a $6,000 individual calendar year deductible, a $40,000 annual out-of-pocket max, and um, they only have about 30% participation in the plan. So. And obviously, that plan does not meet the minimum uh, plan requirements under health care reform. The other thing is that seven of their 22 employees make less in salary of that $45,960 per year. Those individuals would be able to go to the state exchange and qualify for a subsidy because their annual income does not exceed 400% of federal poverty level. If even one of those seven employees goes to a state exchange to even look into the option of coverage and they qualify for a subsidy, that is going to trigger an audit of that company and they will be faced with penalties and fines for every full-time employee that they have currently. Um, and that is something obviously that they need to, that they're in serious consideration about for this year because they need to get their plan up to minimum standards as it relates to health care reform, which is going to increase their costs and they know that their participation is going to increase as a result of that. Um, available only for coverage obtained through exchanges. 
and it's only it's unavailable if the employer offers a qualified plan. So if I'm somebody that makes forty four thousand dollars a year and I go to a state exchange to try to qualify for a subsidy or get you know health insurance through the state through the state, and it they go back and it's found it's discovered that my employer does offer qualified coverage, then no fine or penalty will be imposed to my employer, and I will not qualify for for a state subsidy. Subsidy calculations are complex. The amounts are based on a sliding scale using household income, age, and plan value, and phased out as income approaches 400% of the federal law property level. So the subsidies are greater for people that make less money. It makes sense. And that's all of that information is available on the Covered California website. So what is it? There are two forms of subsidies. There's a premium tax credit and a cost-sharing subsidy, both of which lower the overall cost of health insurance coverage for an individual or family, both of which are based on a sliding income sale scale. Um, those at the bottom receive the most assistance, those at the top receive the least. And both are pegged to silver plans in the state exchanges, meaning that they're automatically going to get that 70% coinsurance level. This is a slide that represents what states we know as of today that are going to be participating or have developed their own state exchange. Um, you'll see the states that are highlighted, I'm sorry, you see the states that are highlighted in blue. All of those states will have state-based exchanges. There are 18 currently. 26 states are going to be federally facilitated exchanges, and then seven states will have partnership exchanges. This is the reason that I wanted to show this slide is that this is really going to be critical in consideration for companies that have multi-state employees. If a business owner is considering going to the state exchange to secure health insurance for their group and they do have multiple employees in multiple states, there needs to be significant oversight um, in terms of the plan quality and details for each one of these state exchanges. So, Again, something to, to take into consideration if, if a business is thinking that the state exchange might be a viable option. I don't anticipate so much in the world that Jen and I work in that we're going to see a lot of our clients or potential clients run out and secure insurance through the state exchange just because it's probably not going to be viewed as a competitive um, option in terms of attracting and retaining good talent. Um, but again, as I said earlier, I do think the state exchanges might be a viable option for some of the uh, smaller mom and pop businesses or companies that haven't previously offered health insurance. Next slide. So the potential impact of business owners. So employers relying on state exchanges for employee medical coverage may be, as I just said, maybe is at a disadvantage against competitors in terms of attracting and retaining good people uh, through a comprehensive benefit strategy. I think this, the, the mindset, and this could change over time, the mindset of the state exchanges is that they're largely being developed for people who have previously not been able to get coverage before, or that the plan quality or the coverage level is going to be subpar. State exchanges medical plans may be viewed as, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself here, may be viewed as lower quality solutions because many believe that the exchanges were developed to serve the uninsured and underinsured. State exchanges may not provide a consistent health insurance solution for employees across multiple states and the exchange products may initially be limited to medical and prescription drugs only, requiring you to seek other solutions for ancillary benefits, such as dental vision, life, personal accidents, and things like that. So here, real quickly, I'm going to talk real quickly about insperity. Can you switch this slide? Yes, thank you. So why Insperity? Um, for those of you who don't know who Insperity is, as I mentioned earlier, we are the, the leading, uh, we, we founded the PEO industry and we lead the industry today. So Jen talked a little bit about, in terms of reporting requirements, the information that's going to have to come from three different repositories. So our clients are completely protected with regards to healthcare reform because we offer solutions that address the challenges of healthcare reform, not only in how we manage our medical plans, um, but also how we're here to assess our, our clients and potentially future clients. So the complexity, we're going to reduce the administrative burden through a dedicated service team and best-in-class IT infrastructure. Compliance, through the relationship we have with our clients, the state, local, and federal compliance actually becomes our responsibility. So anything that relates to remaining compliant will, is Insperity's responsibility on behalf of our clients. And the cost, you know, the way our model works, we're able to stabilize the cost of health care, which we've done for 27 years um, through our fully insured health plan and its low cost structure. So 
Again, shameless plug, for more than 27 years, we've provided large company benefits and employment administration to some of the best and mid-sized companies in America. So, so although we don't have a slide with our contact information, we will email um, everybody who is currently on the webinar with our contact information in case anybody wants to follow up on anything that we've talked about. If there's any information that we can provide you or if you would like us to speak directly with um, your clients or colleagues, you know, please contact Jen Coco. As she just said, we'll be able to send out her contact information to everybody and we'll be happy to assist on the individual level. Okay. Yvonne, can you put my slides up? All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer and Jen. You know, I, I wonder if we could just pause on a couple of the uh, provisions here that I find a lot of questions coming up if you go to the first slide. So one of the things that people ask me a lot about is, well, how do we plan around this? And uh, people say, well, gee, we've heard that if we just have a bunch of part-time employees and we don't have any full-time employees, meaning less than 30 hours a week or under 30 hours a month, then we're not going to have a problem. Uh, is, would that work? It will not work. It will not work, okay? <laughs> not when the IRS is involved. <laughs> And the reason being is that they use part-time, full-time equivalent. Exactly. Full-time, right? Exactly. And, you know, to your point, you just mentioned what we typically look at as a part-time or full-time employee is anybody working 30 hours a week or more is considered full-time. Anyone working 29 hours a week or less is considered part-time. The IRS has a different way of looking at that. Right. And to get, add a little bit to that, the way the IRS looks at it is this full-time equivalent idea. So they'll take these part-time people and they'll, they'll aggregate their hours to determine whether you've got 50 or more full-time people, correct? Absolutely. So you could have all part-time people and still have full-time equivalents and be subject to this law. That's exactly right. And we've actually seen that done in the past just so that they can get away from offering health insurance. Um, that's, not, that's no longer going to be an option. Okay. Um, so uh, some of the other things that are, I guess, a little bit maybe confusion, confusing or, or maybe surprising or counterintuitive about this is the idea that you may end up with penalties if you have just one person, just one single employee that, that has to go to a state exchange or a state subsidy. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that works? Because I think that might surprise some people. Sure. So um, what you're referring to, Roger, is so it. it you know, I think Jen depicted that on one of the slides. If I'm an employer, and let's say I'm going to use that company up in Washington that I just referred to as an example, their current plan offering doesn't come close to meeting the minimum requirements under health care reform in terms of plan value uh, and affordability. So if one of those employees goes to the state exchange as an option to get better health insurance for less money because I now qualify for a subsidy, that is going to trigger an audit of the company that I work for. The penalties, if it, you know, through the, through the discovery of that audit, it is found that the plan, or they discover that the plan does not meet minimum requirements under health care reform, those penalties and fees will then be imposed for every full-time employee of my employer's company. Okay, thanks. Yvonne, could you skip ahead to the Cadillac tax slide? I think it's worth mentioning, this is going to be several years, but we've heard a lot, uh, one more, one more, one more. In 2018, of course, we're going to, we've heard a lot in the news about the Cadillac tax, we've gone one more. And um, the theory is that we want to prevent the overuse of the system by employees with really good plans, very generous health care plans. So starting in 2018, there'll be a 40% tax on the portion of the annual health benefits that exceeds $10,200 per year for single coverage or $27,500 for family coverage. So Jennifer and Jen, I wonder if you could weigh in. Uh, do you, is that really an excessive amount? And how many people, do you think a lot of people might get caught by this surprise 40% tax? You know, I think that this, I, yes, I think definitely. You know, I mean, what we've seen over the past several years are, as I mentioned earlier, a number of clients or companies really taking a good hard look at what they're paying for health insurance costs. And it's something that if there isn't constant oversight, you know, it's, I was looking at a company that I talked to five years ago, we're talking to them again today, and their health insurance costs over the last five years have gone up 100%. So it creeps up incrementally year over year. I don't think, you know, when we look at certain groups, 
I know that they're paying more than $10,200 a year for individual health insurance. So at that point, what does the company do? To avoid this 40% tax on the additional amount, are they going to lower their plan contributions? Are they going to lower you know, the amount that they're paying toward the medical? Um, I think this is going to affect probably a relatively small number of companies, but definitely something that needs to be taken into consideration. Okay. So uh, Jennifer and Jen, how do people get a hold of you if they have additional questions about uh, the Affordable Care Act and how to comply with it? So they can email um, me, Jen Coco, and um, that email address is Jen, J-E-N, K-O, K-K-O, at Insperity.com. Um, we have actually, with Insperity, we have a healthcare reform hotline that we have access to as well as our clients have access to. So if anyone wants to email me any questions, I'd be happy to um, call the hotline and get back to you with answers. And it's Jen.Coco at Insperity.com. Thanks, Jen. Yes. N.K-O-K-K-O at Insperity.com. Thanks, Jen. And you can also reach me on my office line, which is 925-287-4945. Once again, that's 925-287-4945. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer and Jen. This is Roger Royce, founder of the Royce Law Firm. This has been our webinar on the Affordable Care Act and how to comply. Uh, as mentioned, this is being recorded. You will find a full recording of this webinar on the Royce Law YouTube site on Royce University webinars and in the iTunes uh, in the iTunes store as a download podcast. Uh, in addition, the materials will be available as a transcript on Royce University and the slides will be on SlideShare. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Jennifer and Jen. I'd like to thank you folks in the audience for attending and remind you that our next upcoming webinar will be on June 25 going to be at 3D printing, so be sure to tune in uh, to find out about uh, 3D printing and all the mischief that can cause. <laughs> and uh, that will now conclude our webinar.